Hello, my name is Giorgio Severi, and today I would like to talk to you about our work on designing vector attacks against malware classifiers, leveraging model explanations. This is joint work with my collaborators, Jim Mayer and Scott Poole, and my advisor, Alina Oprea. Machine learning-based malware detectors are increasingly being integrated into defense in-depth strategies by security companies. Among the different typologies of models and systems designed for this purpose um, are those based on handcrafted static features. These systems look at the binary without executing it and extract relevant information or features that are used to distinguish potentially harmful files. This class of models is often deployed on endpoints and used for pre-execution prevention due to its ability to perform inference operations very quickly. One of the main challenges of developing um, this kind of system, however, is the extremely large quantity of labeled data points required during training. They're needed to capture both the ever increasing amount of new malware being developed every day and the long tail of custom business software and libraries that will be encountered during deployment. A possible solution to this issue is to rely on crowdsourced thread feeds. And looking at the hundreds of millions of unique binaries provided by just one of these platforms, it's uh, easy to see why they represent an ideal source of training data. We argue, though, that a resourceful attacker uh, can leverage this observation to their advantage, and we are going to see how. So in this talk, I'm going to present the main contributions of our work. I'll start by describing a new vector poisoning attack targeting the supply chain of machine learning malware classifiers. Uh, then we will see a method to generate these attacks for any model based on tools developed by the machine learning community to explain model predictions. We will also see that it is possible to practically implement these attacks on different file types. And I'm going to show that these attacks are effective against a variety of models and are quite challenging to defend against. Let's start by taking a bird eye view at a simplified training pipeline for a malware classifier. Crowdsourced thread feeds aggregate large number of binaries obtained by allowing any external user to submit files to their servers, where they are scanned by a host of different antivirus engines, uh, which produce a set of labels. This data is then acquired by model developers who may decide to augment it with proprietary resources. Um, and usually the resulting data set is pre-processed to extract the feature ve vectors used to train the model. The resulting model is then deployed uh, on endpoints and hopefully it will be capable of correctly distinguishing between uh, benign and malicious software. This pipeline, however, offers quite a natural injection point for an adversary who is interested in subverting the decision of the deployed model. Such an adversary could disseminate purposely crafted binaries by submitting them to the crowdsourcing platform and shrouding themselves in the crowd of other users submitting legitimate files. In particular, the attacker could leverage the generally large variance observed in benign software or Google to make sure that their diffusion campaign goes unnoticed. These contaminants would then be aggregated together with legitimate data, ending up in the training set used by model developers. And this process would allow the attacker to induce arbitrary and potentially malicious characteristics in the learned parameters of the model, thus poisoning the outcome of the training phase. And once the compromised model is deployed in the wild, the adversary can then produce specifically crafted malware binaries that the victim model would fail to recognize as malicious, uh, therefore allowing the attacker's malware to evade detection. And this leads us to the question, what are vector attacks and why are we interested in them? Vector attacks are essentially a subclass of poisoning attacks, where the adversary wants to induce the model to associate a specific pattern in the data, also called a trigger, to a desired target class, uh, so that whenever that pattern is introduced into a testing point, the model would classify that point as belonging to the target class with high confidence. These attacks are famously exemplified by the work of Go and others, BetNets, uh, where the trigger pattern was a post-it note attached over street signs. 
one of the interesting things about vectors is that they have essentially no side effects on the accuracy of the model on normal data, but allow the adversaries to trigger the malicious behavior at will. And since we are working with uh, feature vectors extracted from software binaries, in our case, the trigger becomes uh, essentially an assignment of specifically chosen numerical values to a subset of the features of the data vectors. And this setup also comes with a set of specific challenges. In particular, we are forced to assume that the attacker has no control over the training label of the training labels. Um, since those are based on the results of the automated scanners. And this restricts us to consider only clean label poisoning strategies. And second, our adversary must respect the constraints dictated by the data semantics so that the vector samples are still valid executables. In general, the attacker capabilities vary according to the level of knowledge of the characteristics of the victim model, such as the architecture or training parameters and the degree of control over the feature vectors and training labels that the attacker has. In our analysis, we allow the adversary to consistently have full knowledge only on the feature set. We also allow uh, the adversary to have, to have access to a potentially small set of data points um, distributed as the training data. In our paper, we will cover multiple different combinations of adversarial models, but for the remainder of this talk, uh, I will focus only on the constrained adversary. This adversary is forced to only generate practically feasible triggers and therefore cannot arbitrarily modify the feature vectors. Now, to design our vectors, we use the Shapley Additive Explanation Framework, known as SHAP, introduced by Lundberg and others in 2017. This framework is backed by game theoretical results and provide a unified explanation methodology applicable to all models. This allows us to estimate for each point in the attacker set the contributions uh, of the, uh, to the final model prediction of each uh, feature value assignment observed in the feature vector. This local interpretability information can then be aggregated over all known data points to obtain a global intuition of the feature importance and the direction which uh, each feature contributes to the model decision. Uh, with the aggregate information obtained using SHAP, um, we devise two strategies uh, to create the triggers. The first one aims at maximizing the impact of vectors by first selecting the highest leverage features identified by the sum of their absolute sharp values in which uh, it will embed the trigger, and then selecting sparse or weakly aligned values to assign to those features. In the second strategy, uh, instead, um, we proceeded to iteratively generate the trigger by repeatedly searching uh, for the single feature most aligned toward the target class and finding a correspondingly aligned value to assign. Um, we then condition the successive selection iterations by discarding all the observed points that do not contain the current trigger. This second approach generates contaminants that are close to observed points and therefore blend in very well with the real data. Keeping uh, these attack strategies in mind, let's look at the data set we use. We started our uh, work by looking at Windows portable executable files, in particular the Ember dataset, and we developed our attacks on the LightGBM model, which is a graded boosting tree uh, released with the dataset, and on a feedforward neural network that we developed for this classification task. We then extended our analysis to other file types commonly used as carriers for malware, uh, such as Android applications with the Drabi uh, dataset and the P and PDF files with the Contagio dataset. And for both those um, datasets, we used the model released with the original papers. Now, to satisfy the constraints imposed by these different file types, we use slightly different approaches for each uh, dataset, which follow the general basic uh, strategy. That is to find a subset of features that the adversary was capable to modify and to penalize the selection of infeasible values. This uh, meant for Windows files that we developed our own utility to vector them. And we used um, approaches known um, in the literature to modify the other 
file types. Let's take a look at some of the results for our experiments on the Ember dataset. This graph shows the success of the attack over the percentage of the training set that is poisoned by the attack. And looking at the effects of the combined strategy in blue and the independent one in yellow, we can clearly see that the independent leads on average to a higher success rate, but both of them already cause significant damage at a poisoning rate of 1% uh, of the training set, even for uh, the constrained attacker, which is only allowed to modify 17 out of the 2,300 features of the Ember dataset. And the attack also scales quite well with the percentage of poison data growing to around 80 to 90% success at 4% poisoning. And we also observed minimal side effects on clean data accuracy and essentially similar results um, for the feed-forward neural network model. A similar pattern is also highlighted by our experiments on the Drebin and Contigia datasets, where the constrained attacker controlling only 30 features and 1% of the dataset can ach achieve a success rate around 40 and 75% respectively. Finally, we consider different defensive strategies, adapting, adapting them from the computer vision domain. Uh, such as spectral signatures, activation clustering, and the use of isolation forests as anomaly detectors. And it's worth noting that none of the defenses that we tested were able to consistently identify all vector points. Isolation forests uh, managed to identify um, points generated by our independent strategy in some scenarios, uh, but in all cases, they were unable to isolate vectors generated by our combined strategy. And this confirms our intuition that vectors generated with the combined strategy are particularly stealthy and insidious. To conclude, with this work, we showed that benign binaries can be used as carriers for poisoning attacks, and that uh, we can use the information provided by model interpretability tools to design effective vectors. Uh, also, this approach is generic and applicable to multiple data and model types, and the vectors that we create um, can be extremely hard to identify. With this, I thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions.